The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. We're in a, a, a study of the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. And we've studied, we're studying chapters 8, 9, and 10, and we're in 10 now. And we're just flying through this thing. And uh, Shirley says she can, she can miss two or three weeks and come back to the same text. Uh, and I, I guess that's the truth. Uh, verse 11, 12, and 13. Let's see if I forgot to look in the English. Let's see. There's 11. There's 12. There's 13. Yeah, in the English... It shows you that that's one sentence. And in the Greek, it does. That's one Greek sentence, 11, 12, 13. I'm going to do 11 and 12 to, to this week, and I'm going to do 13 next week. Uh, verse 11 and 12 shows the superiority of the redemption of Christ, of the, new, the, the, import, the superiority of the redemptive work of Christ in the new covenant over the old covenant. And then verse 13 talks about the second coming of Christ. So the first coming is ver first coming of Christ, 11 and 12. The second coming of Christ, verse 13. Here's what it says. It talked about the old covenant. Every priest stands. And that's really important. I want you to pay attention to the difference between the word stand and set. Pay attention to that now. Every priest, talking about Levitical priest of the old covenant, every priest stands daily ministering. That's priestly ministering in the Greek. That's a Greek word for sacrificial work, uh, stands daily ministering and offering time after time or yearly the same sacrifices, watch this now, which can never take away sins. See that? But he, talking about Christ, that's a capital H in my Bible, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for what? All times. Watch this. Did what? Sat down. See, he's talking about priestly work, set down. Why? Because Listen, why? Because the work of redemption was completed. He sat down. He sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And then that first half, verse 13, waiting from that time. What time? Waiting from what time? What's the Bible? No, I'm looking for the Bible. What the Bible says is not. From the time he sat down, which we call session. He seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven in session. From session, waiting from that time, session onward until his enemies be made his footstools for his feet. We call that Operation Footstool. That's the second coming of Christ. See, it's really important that Christ completes the work of redemption, goes home, sets down, waiting to come back a second time. We call that work of Christ at the right hand of God the Father today in a resurrection body seated at the, on the throne on the, waiting waiting to be given the orders to come back a second time. Okay, we call that second. So the first coming, second coming uh, is in that and we'll talk about 11 and 12 tonight and then next week we'll talk about verse 13, Operation Footstool, which is a big deal. In fact, Operation Footstool pl plays a big role in our um, Wednesday night study, which is the angelic conflict, talking about uh, the spiritual warfare, where it, how it orig how the origin of spiritual warfare. Um, you know, Star Wars before Star Wars became Star Wars. Yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty good. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into our study for this evening. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality or fleshliness is personal sin in a believer's life. It could be, as I said, mental attitude sin, or it could be sin of the tongue or reverse sin. It must be confessed before you study because the Bible, the Bible becomes a living book under the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the human soul. The Holy Spirit will teach you great things tonight if you'll have ears to hear. Yeah, 
Marion, uh, check on that door. That door, something's going. Oh. Okay. <laughs> now. Yeah. All right, Horton. All right. Now, now we'll pray. Confess your sins if necessary, people, and then, Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way in the storm. Pray for many people would be out without power tonight, and uh, many may have difficulty getting home. And so, we pray for that. Uh, we pray tonight the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of our to our souls from the Word of God, talking about one sacrifice for all the sins, past, present, and future. Uh, and the writer of Hebrew makes a big deal out of that in the 11th chapter, verse 39 and 40, that completed work. And so we live in the day of the new covenant in which the completed work, Jesus sets at the right hand of God the Father in session, waiting until the second coming. How exciting that'll be. Uh, encourage our hearts tonight, Father, for we live in that period of session on earth, the responsibility and the angelic conflict in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. Uh, the Greek, it, the second thing I want to show you, uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned the first part of this in my introduction. The second part is that something you can't see in the English, except one time. Uh, notice that in verse 12, see the word but? That's day. That's, that's D-E. But what you can't see that's in the Greek language is that verse 11 has men. That Greek word men. And in the Greek language, you always look for these. If you say, if you see men day, then what you have is a sequence of something going on. You have a sequence. And it, it's all over the New Testament. But in the English, you can't, you can't see the word men. But in the Greek language, that, that verse 11, is, it's going to be way up front. And it's going to set up day. It's, there's a, we know now that there's a sequence going on, and you're going to see three things in these verses. That, this is verse 11 and 12 is where the sequence is. And remember that we're talking about one sentence now, though, right? And so this sequence is in verse 11 and, and, the, and goes into partial 13, waiting, setting, and waiting. But here are the three things, and I, I, I don't want to include that fourth one. Come, I'm going to get a whole study off from it. Are you with me? But there are three things here that are really important because that thing requires it. And um, I mentioned this in your uh, notice ver uh, point well, in my internet. The Greek Mende sequence of contrast. In this case, it's a sequence. This sets up a sequence uh, of con of contrast. And we're going to have three mentioned here. And my study tonight is to show you that. And what they're going to contrast, the men here, now remember that's a Greek word, that's not an English word. Okay. This is Old Covenant. Every, that, that's going to, it's going to have a men, a, a men day. And day is going to be the New Covenant over here. Are you with me? That's going to be New Covenant. This is going to be Old Covenant. And it's going to contrast something for the new. Are you with me? So each of these, it's going to be, that men is going to be here. That's old covenant. And over here is going to be day. And we're going to contrast all the way through. Are you? Are, I know I get tired of saying that myself. So I know you must get tired of hearing it. Uh, there's contrast. Now, like I said, in the Greek language, it, it's very clear because Mende is a principle in the Greek language. In the English, they often don't show that to you. Uh, so you have to kind of figure it out. But if you know the Greek, then it helps you to say we're in a sequence. And, and, and then you start looking. Well, I know it's contrast because we've been contrasting the superiority of the new covenant, the day in which you and I live, over the old covenant. 
the New Testament over the Old Testament as somehow, as somehow people might say. But it's, it's covenant, okay? So that's important that you understand that. All right, it's important. So, for example, in verse 11, when you look at verse 11, uh, uh, you got the men up there. It says, and every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifice which can never take away sin. And then in, in verse 12, but, you see, so what I want to do is I want to, so he's offering it. So what I did, I, I laid this out in your paper. So I want you to look at your paper. Look at verse 1. The first, the first midday contrast between the old covenant Leviticus priest standing and Jesus Christ setting. Are you with me that? That's the first contrast. And, um, and that's a big deal. Now, you know, the casual reader goes through there and they got the priest standing. They don't think anything like Jesus setting. So what? But it is a big deal theologically. And the writer has, has made it a big deal by the midday sequence of contrast. So when we look at it, here's what it says. It, it says, every priest stands. That's histomy. Now, there's nothing unique about histomy. In the Greek language, histomy, H-I-S-T-E-M-I, histomy means to stand, I mean, it's, you know, stand at attention or whatever. What's interesting here, if this is a main verb, that's important because I got two participles. That's a main verb. And it's in the perfect, it's a perfect active indicative. Tell me what the perfect tense means. Com completed in the past. Action completed in the past. The results of remains completed forever or until God in his word somehow declares it different, right? And, and in this word, he does. So we have every priest, and he's talking about Leviticus priest, the Old Testament priest, stands, perfect tense, and the perfect tense, we know something about the perfect tense because we're told in verse 12 what's going to cause the change. He is to stand as he performs all the shadow Christology of sacrifices for sin, all right? Well, it doesn't matter. I'm not asking for approval on this. I'm just saying that's right, okay? He stands, and he stands, and he is not, and he is to always stand until something occurs so that God changes that whole deal. So what is he standing for? He is standing while he's doing shadow crystal. He's standing because redemption, which he is talking to his people about, is not going to be completed until Jesus Christ comes. How do I know it? Verse 12. Verse 12 says, uh, in verse 12 he says, but he, right? Yes. But he, and, and what's he going to do? He's going to sit down. When he comes, he will sit down because the work. So the priest, in the perfect tense, he has to stand performing all of these rituals. He stands because he's, co he's committed to stand until Christ comes and completes his work. And he has to teach the people that. And how is Christ going to complete that work? Well, he's going to go to the cross and he's going to die for our sins and the sins of the entire world. He's going to be buried and on the third day raised from the dead. That's called the gospel. And when you believe it, you get saved. Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes it. If you believe it, you get saved. If you don't believe it, if you think it's just a bunch of gobbledygook, then you don't get saved. You don't get saved because you come to church tonight. You don't get saved because you carry a Bible. You get saved because you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You believe he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. That's how you get saved. And you don't get saved by yourself. You get saved because the gospel is the power of God to save you when you believe it. And therefore, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you're saved by what? Grace, right? Through faith, right? By grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. Not of works, least any man boast. So 
this was the Old Testament, uh, the perfect that now the word ministry is a special word in the Greek language to declare that that this is priestly ministry of offering or sacrifices of shadow Christology. And it says this will this this redemption that I'm telling you will not be completed until Christ comes, dies on a cross, is buried and raised from the dead. Isaiah 52, 53. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And when he dies on the cross, everybody uh, over here that had redemption, waiting for the completion of it, when he dies on the cross, their redemption is completed. How about that? And everybody going forward, his redemption is completed because he offers one sacrifice for all sin for all time. And boy, he pounds this. He really pounds this. So one of the first contrasts that you have is you have standing over here on this side of the cross, and you have, here you have the priest who stands. Over here you have the priest setting, the high priest, Jesus Christ. And so that's the first. And then he tells you over here, because the work is not completed, the offerings that are being offered can never take away, what's he say? Can never take away what? Sins, Sins. Sins. Which, which he means completely. Now, when they died, did they go to heaven? Of course they did. Because they believed in this. You see, we live in a day when this deal is completed. No, you see, you're missing that, but I can't, I can't, I can't help that. Right. Yeah, I think that, that. Every priest stands daily, ministry and offering. These are present active participles. These are present active participles that work off the main verb. Participles work off a main verb. The main verb is standing. Here's the priest standing. He's ministering sacrificial offerings, shadow Christology. He's making these offerings, you know, the goats and the, the calves and all that stuff, with the view that one day the Messiah would come and bring completion to this system. And when Christ dies on a cross, buried and raised from the dead, that system is done. And how did God prove that that system was done? How, how, what did he do? The veil. Drop that veil from that temple, from the, the, the holies of holies. That did, and that's where that was done. That deal was over, right? And that, listen, that's what all of these people look for theologically, the coming of Christ. And so the writer says, the sacrifices, the, the, uh, the, 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 he stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, the sacrifices which could never take away sin. And by he, what he means by take away, what he means by that is he uses a really interesting word. He puts peri on the front, this word take away. He puts peri on the word ateo. I think that's R. Uh, let me look again. Yeah, Ario. It means to lift up and away, and and it it it, it means completion. It, it is a word that means that this shows that that's completed. It, they it never was completed until Christ comes, dies on the cross, buried and raised from the dead. Then that's completed. That's see that that completes that perfect tense. That's pretty good stuff. I, I, I'm telling you, that's pretty good stuff right there. Then in verse 12, he says, but he, see, I'm sta standing men. Now we got day, but he, Jesus Christ, having offered, now he puts this in an heiress participle. He puts this in an heiress participle. Here's, these are in the present tense looking for this day. When that day comes, that's completed. That, so he puts it in the heiress tense to show you that that was, that was perfect. When that happens, then this becomes an aorist. As an aorist part of that, that's so good. I'm going to tell you. 
I wish I was a better teacher and could, could really tell you how important this is. Having offered one sacrifice, having offered one sacrifice, remember many sacrifices compared to one, offering, may, offering one sacrifice for sins for what? For all time. Sat down. See, that's the contrast. There's the first contrast. Under the old covenant, Priest stood because the work of redemption would not be finished until Christ died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. I gave you scripture to back that up. And then in Hebrews 9, 12, it's not through the blood. It was never through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. In other words, the, the blood of the, all, of the, all the blood sacrifice of the Old Testament were shadow Christology pointing to the blood of Christ. It was never about the blood of the animals. It was that the blood of the animals showed that one day Christ would come and his own blood would be sufficient. So what's John call him? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. See, that's, that's great theology of the Old Covenant. That's what they believed for all those thousands of years. <laughs> it's so good. I can't stand this. Now watch, I want you to draw, I want you, uh, are you at Hebrews 12, 9? I want you to draw a line, okay? S draw a line under the word not through, not through. Do you see that? Not through. Don't, don't, lie, don't, don't draw a line through it, draw a line under it, not through. Are you with me? Now, not through the blood of goats and calves, but through, underline but through. See, not through, but through. Uh -huh. See, that's a contrast, isn't it? Yeah. See, not through the blood of, b blood of goats and calves, that shadow of Christology, but through his own blood. See, that's what blood, that was the shadow of the blood of the substance. Do you see that, people? I think pr probably all of my, if you're, if you're wondering, all my, all my descriptions, all my scripture that I'm printing out comes from the New American Standard Bible. So if you have a King James or something like that, they may vary a little, but they won't vary much. Uh, but not through, but through is very good. But through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all. He's talking about heaven. Where, where he sat, where's he seated? That's where he went when the work was done, right? That's what he's talking about here. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained what? Having, having obtained what? Yeah, circle that, baby. Circle that one. That's important. Is that not, you know why? You know why it's eternal? Because it's complete. See, it was eternal in prophecy. Now it's in reality. It's in history. See, we offer people eternal redemption. The work is completed. When he comes a second time, it won't be for sin. Hebrews 9.28, won't be for sin. That's the first coming. Hebrews 9.28. When the work of God's redemption was completed, Jesus Christ returned to heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father. And I, I put some scriptures down. And sometime this week, I gave you one, two, three, four, five, six. I gave you six. And that's just a little bit. I figured I better not give more than six. I mean, you can read these on the toilet. So I didn't give you more, right? You have a Bible next to it, don't you? What kind of books do you keep in there? All right. So and here's what I want you to look for. Here's what I want you to look for. This is a great study now. Hey, I'm joking with you a little bit, a tad bit. But well, here's what's important. I want you to look for the word sat. And he's going to tell you some wonderful things about what Christ is doing while he is seated at the right hand of God the Father in session. And, and listen, they're going to tell you in these passages of Scripture some wonderful things that you get now and forever because he's seated. Ah, uh, it's okay. You're not getting it. That's all right. Let me put it on the board. Let's get this. Because he's seated. Not because he died on the cross. He died on the cross so he could be seated. 
there are things we get because he's seated. Now, now watch this. Watch this. He's got to do that before he can do that. Before he can be seated right hand of God the Father in heaven. Are you with me? Yes. That's important. This whole word sat is what you get there from Christ. He's got to get there. He's got to do that in order to get there. And when he gets there, you get things there. We call that positional truth. And it, it's carried by the phrase in, I'm going to say in Christ, in him or in Christ. For example, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Right? That, that's an example. Now, once you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit bab baptizes you into union with Christ. That's new covenant thinking. Baptizes you into union with Christ. And union with Christ means he's in session. And how long is he going to be in session? Listen to me. Mm, not forever. All the way through the church age. Till he comes again. When's he going to come again? Rapture. Come on now. See? Yeah, that's when he's coming back. Rapture. And listen, because he's in, the, there are things that we get in, positionally in Christ while he's in session, seated. Now, have I teased you enough? Well, I, I hope I've teased you enough to read all these scriptures I put down. I gave you six scriptures. I said to you, pay attention to the word sat because they're part of your inheritance. These are important things that you can have. So pay attention to that. Okay? I can't do all that because I only have an hour. Yes. Pastor Session, you see it should go together. Yep. He's why waiting. That's during the church age. Right, during the church age. Yeah. At the end of the church age, he returns. He returns. Yeah. That's the, that's the rapture. Right. Well, the, yeah, rapture. us going up is a rapture. Okay. Yep. Now, what I'm telling you, pay attention to these passages. I just gave you a few to tease you, but there's the pat. And what this is about, the positional truth is about what we get while he's in session. The whole category is called positional truth. It's positional truth. This is called positional truth. And the moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into union with Christ. That's positional truth. But what I'm trying to share with you tonight, there's, there are things you get from the death, burial, and resurrection, and there are things you get from session. He, he, he dies on a cross. He's buried. He's raised. Forty days later, he sends to the Father, and it's called being seated. That We call that session because he's operational during this whole period. And that period happens to be our period. That period is the church age. It's dynamite. And this is important stuff for you and I. These are the grace operating assets that we have that have been given to us by the grace of God to equip us for the day in which we live, which is the last days of human history. This is so good. Oh, this is so good. I mean, this is lights out stuff. Here's a principle. Here's a new covenant doctrinal principle. Because Jesus Christ is seated in heaven, every church age believer is seated positionally in him forever. Now watch this. I'm going to, I'm going to just give you one. All right? Let me give you one. And this one is not listed on your paper. This is number seven. Okay? I'm in Ephesians, the second chapter. Now, there are some in the first chapter, but I'm in the second chapter. And I'm just going to read to you. Just sit back and relax. I'm going to read to you verses. Now, this thing starts from verse one, but I'm going to pick it up at verse four. But God, rich in mercy with great love and grace. Okay? Listen to what he says. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, 
made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him. Watch this now. Raised us up with him. See here? How did he do that? How did he raise us up with him? You understand that? That's the baptism will work of the Holy Spirit. Watch this now. And raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, that's session. Right? He's in heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Seated. Well, wait, don't, don't get ahead of me. Yeah, you do. But listen, I, I want you to pay attention to it. How are we? You're missing this. How are we? Now, here we are right here now. We get saved. How, how are we identified with him? In that passage, I don't want your opinion. I want the word of God. Seated. Seated, seated Look at that. We are seated. Look, look, we are seated. See the word, look, what did seated, what did standing versus seated, tell me what standing meant. No, I know, but tell me the bottom line. The, the redemption hadn't been completed. What did, what did seated mean? It was completed. Oh, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit, by God's grace, into the position of a seated position in Christ. We call that eternal security. If there was ever a security for you, there it is. You can't lose something like that. You, the moment you believe the gospel of Christ, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ and into a position of what? Seated. And what does that mean? Into a completed, a completed redemptive work of God. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it, but you got it. You can't lose it because it was given to you in a seated position that Christ earned for you. You don't earn seated with Christ. And where is he seated? at the right hand of God. And where are we seated? We're seated in Christ at the right hand of God. Now listen to me. Make this connection. John 10, 28. You know what John 10, 28 says? That you're in the hands of God. You're in the hands of Christ who is in the hands of God and nobody can take you out. You know why that's important? Because that's completed right there. The answer to that, well, well, probably, uh, but you could, nobody else could get you out, but you could get yourself out. Oh, no, you can't. Quit that foolishness. Where do you get that idea? Yeah. Ah, thank you. <laughs> oh, and, and listen what else he says. I, 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 I got carried away. In order that in the ages to come, he might show... This is because we're seated in him now that he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us who are in Christ Jesus. I mean, you think you got a lot of grace now? You don't have an idea what the surpassing grace is going to come to you after, listen, after Christ comes again, whether you come from heaven or come up from earth, you're going to step into surpassing grace, a grace principle that you can, your mind can't fathom. <laughs> this is so good. I mean, I, can't, I love it. For, and listen to verse 8. For by, listen to what he says, for by grace. It's surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of results of works that anyone should boast. See the context in which that wonderful passage is? Do you see the context of that? <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Man, how can my heart stand that? Thank you. Listen to the second mandate. That's the first one. Stand, standing versus setting, right? 
Wow, here's the second one. The second mandate contrast in this passage is between the old, the old covenant offering time after time or yearly and the New Testament offering once for all time. Once for all time. For all time means forever. Means forever. You know why? Because God's redemptive plan is completed. When Christ died on that cross, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, it was done. Jesus said it himself, didn't he? He said, in, in John 19, 30, he said it's finished. You know who he spoke that to? He spoke it to the Father. Here's the men. Here's the men part of the old covenant. The old covenant sacrificial offerings were made time after time waiting for Christ to come and die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead. New covenant. The new, te the new covenant sacrificial offer was made by Jesus Christ for sins for all time. One time for all time. So we have, here's, Hebrew, here's how the 10th chapter of Hebrews opened 100 years ago for us. <laughs> it's so long, you don't remember what, how this chapter started. Here's what, it, here's what it says. For the law, old covenant, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, we live in the good things to come. Listen, we're in the good things. The good things that they wanted to see come, we, we, they're everyday stuff for us. That's, a normal, that's just normal standard. That's just the average. Only a shadow of good things to come and not the very form of the substance, which is Christ, can never by the same sacrifice which they offered year by year make perfect those who draw near. Why? Waiting on what? Not waiting on them to pull up their britches and get down to work and do the work that God has sent for you. To. No, no, waiting for Christ to come and finish the work. And don't let the law, the law is about works that lead you, should lead you to Christ and it leads you away from them. Should lead you to Christ. The law should lead you to Christ, right? Now it leads you to Christ. And if it leads you to Christ, it leads you to the new covenant and it leads you to grace. If the law brings you to Christ, Christ brings you to grace. Law don't bring you to Christ and then take up the law. I hope people listen to me somewhere in the world. Here's T Hebrews 10.10. 10. By this will, which is described in 10.9, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know, he goes on the cross. One of the things we get out of this is sanctified, which is both the work of Christ on the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit from it. It's a wonderful Wonderful thing, this word idea of sanctification. And then uh, verse, verse 14, 10, 14, where we're headed a couple of weeks from now. By one offering, watch this, he has perfected, which means completed, finished. He has perfected or completed for all time those who are sanctified. You know who are sanctified? Every person that believes the gospel of Jesus Christ is placed into positional truth. He's, he is positionally sanctified. It's called positional sanctification. I cannot begin to tell you how many people don't know that in the church. That's, a, that's, a, that's pitiful that they don't know it because that's a one-on-one doctrine. I just gave you a one-on-one doctrine. Here's the third thing that we need to see before we close this out today. The third men day contrast is the old covenant between many sacrifices that never take away sin and the new covenant, one sacrifice that takes the sin away forever. You know, many Christians, their life is burdened with guilt and shame over sin. They confess their sin and they're still guiltful and shameful because they don't understand that the work of Christ on the cross takes care of it, takes away your sin for how long? Not till tomorrow, not till the next year. That's old covenant thinking. That's legalism thinking. That's law thinking. That's not grace thinking. 
And listen, not only does he take it away, he remembers it no more. So you have no right to do that. Wouldn't that be nice to know that? I can't make you believe it, but I can sure tell it to you. And I can't tell you how many people I meet that are just burdened down with guilt of sin. I say, well, did you know what Christ did for you? Apparently not. Do you not understand that works not only at the cross, but it works in confession? When you confess your sin, what's he say? I what? Remember it no more. He says, if you confess your sin, I am faithful just to forgive your sin, and for, and, right? And to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Glorious day. What a glorious day that is, right? Glorious day. Well, that's a hymn we could sing. Oh, glorious day. Takes away the sin. In the old covenant, never could take away sin. In the new covenant, it takes away forever. One death, one burial, one resurrection, one time, boom, got it. Got it. People, you just need to embrace and love that principle. That's the principle of grace. That's the principle of God's mercy in the new covenant. In the old covenant, never take away sin. In the new covenant, one sacrifice sin for all time or forever. Jesus Christ setting down shows the completion of God's redemptive plan for the forgiveness of sin. It was completed. And Hebrews 11, 39, 40 is a great passage to remember because it tells how he picked up all these old, co old covenant people in that completed work. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 26. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, since the consummation of the ages, we've talked about that, he has been manifested, historically appeared incarnation to put away sin by the sacrifice of what? Himself. Who himself. Everybody walking around the Christian faith, they, they have this guilt and they punish themselves and I'm not worthy and I can't do this. Pastor, I'd like to come, but I'm not worthy. I'd like to do this, but I'm not worthy. Well, what are you talking about, you legalist? What are you talking about? Who ever told you that stuff? We have been set free through the work of Christ. Hey, walking around. A guy one time said, people that do that is like walking around with a corpse on you, having a dead body on you. You're alive carrying a dead person. That's the work of the flesh. Get rid of that thing. I mean, somebody would tell you drop it, wouldn't they? As soon as you got in the hot car, somebody go like, whew. Somebody's got to do something here. So Christ also, here's, here's, here's 928. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time without reference to sin. You know why? Because that's been done. That's completed. That's kaput to those who eagerly await him. Next week, we're going to talk about waiting Waiting, this is where we are, along with him, waiting from that time forward until he comes back and manifests Operation Footstool. We'll talk about Operation Footstool next week off of that, out of verse 13. Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll let the people who visited us by Internet sign off, and then we'll go into our personal prayer time. Father, we're so thankful to have Horton back with us. What a great report we've had briefly from him. Hope to hear more about this uh, on Sunday, but we're, we're, we're thankful to have him back off the road. And, and what a great report and how encouraging it is to know that there is a real work of God among the youth of America today. It reminds me of the 70s and the 80s. And I'm thankful to be alive, to be a part of another, another great spiritual revival movement in America. We're on the fronting edge of it, Father, and we want to be right in the mix of it. This is going to be an exciting time.
I can feel it in my bones. And, uh, and Horton too. Horton sees it. We've, we've come out of this. And uh, thank you for this great group of people that came today to study with us under, under, you know, kind of little extreme conditions because of the weather. But what great students they are. To set with poise under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, learn the word of God, and we thank you for it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.